I want to tell you the story of Euclides de Cunha. As a war correspondent, de Cunha was sent to report on an uprising in the backlands of Brazil, as the nation was being newly formed into a republic at the end of the 19th century. That uprising became known as the Canudos War, and de Cunha's writings on it, in his book Os Sertoes, would become incredibly influential in shaping the future of the nation and of Latin America as a whole. In Osertois, de Cunha documents a tragic story of a destitute community of communists, monarchists, and religious fanatics who are gunned down by the forces of the new Brazilian Republic. His story ends as four survivors making their last stand die heroically, and Canudos is no more. But this might not really be what happened. Accounts vary on many details. Some say that people living in the community didn't come for only religious reasons. Some say that the complete destitution that de Cunha described wasn't exactly accurate. And some say there were more survivors than de Cunha accounted for. In this video, we're not going to tell a story of the insatiable violence of the nation state, as de Cunha might want us to. Instead, it's a story of the responsibility of the historian and how questioning the authority of historical texts can bring us to an entirely new understanding of history as a whole. This story takes place in Canudos, a semi-religious, unincorporated community in the desert northern part of Brazil. It's 1893, and the Republic of Brazil has just been founded in the urban and affluent centers of the country's south. Isolated, culturally and geographically, the people of Canudos live mostly outside of the reach of the new Brazilian government, and they oppose the new system of taxes, the imposition of standardized measurement, and mandatory military conscription. But society in the south of Brazil is modernizing, and the reach of the state is intensifying to keep a pace. If Brazil is to be a state on par with Europe at the turn of the 20th century, a whole new organization of society must be created. And this society requires unifying and homogenizing the country. These modernizing forces from Rio eventually reach Canudos and are met with resistance, led by a galvanizing religious leader and preacher, Antonio Conceleiro. The state sends out expeditions to the north, and surprisingly, they get defeated by Conceleiro and the people of Canudos. In fact, it's more than a surprise. It's a wake-up call for the new nation-state. It showed that this process of modernization that is radically changing daily life doesn't always win. It is defeated by the strange, backwards ways of life in Canudos. That's unthinkable to everyone back in Rio. It's amazing, like, the levels of rhetoric that kind of blow up around this incident, particularly when they start winning against the various expeditions that are sent there. When a sizable army is sent out and is defeated, then people go up into panic and start to think that there's, like, you know, foreign conspiracies undermining the Brazilian government. I mean, they, they, it's really, it's, it's, an, it's an amazing, kind of just study of conspiracy theories, right? A brutal war follows, and Canudos is razed to the ground by following expeditions of state troops. When 15 of Brazil's leading intellectuals were asked to name the most representative texts of the Brazilian national culture, Os Sertois was rated number one. We talked to Adriana Johnson, professor of comparative literature at University of California, Irvine, to learn what was so enduring about Os Sertois and da Cunha's representation of the war. The way I think the story goes is something like he sees that these are really his compatriots and that this, there's something terrible in the fact that the government is eradicating these people and that they should have found a way to incorporate them, to kind of educate them, civilize them, and then basically writes this um, book that's condemning the war to some extent, saying this was a tragedy, we should not have let this happen, this was a crime, we, you know, we misinterpreted what was happening. This text is then seen as somehow, he's speaking for this community, is the structure, right? He becomes the voice of the voiceless because he's condemning their destruction. And I was really interested in interfering with that assumption. De Cunha's book is at the end of the day a critique of the violence of the state. What he's saying is, how could we have done this to our own people? Why didn't we help them join us. He is sympathetic to their plight and even potentially courageous and radical for standing up to the Brazilian government. But the question that Johnson wants to pose is, is he really the voice of Canudos, the voice of the voiceless? And 
if you think about it, like his solution is basically incorporation to the nation state, and this is precisely what they were fighting against. To the extent that that representation of the community is taken as like the real expression of the community, I think it basically silences and misses out on the possibilities that there's there was a real challenge to the the Republican national state project, right? I think that that's erased. The challenge wasn't the military might of this small group of peasants. It was the existence of an alternative way of life that could coexist side by side with the modernization that Brazil was trying to establish from its centers of power. The Conselheiro's religious teaching was asking, why should we live according to the ways of life that are being pushed onto us from this new Brazil? The destruction of Canudos shows just how threatening this discourse was to Brazil and to its project of unifying the nation. At this point, however, the national storybook had a problem. The whole basis of post-monarchist Brazil was that everyone would be included, but it was clear that the army was deploying violence and really quashing these small, powerless communities. If everyone saw how desperate they were to solidify their authority, it will seem far less legitimate than if they had simply let Canudos be. This is where the Cunha comes in. Even though he's siding with the Republic, he's mourning Canudos. He's telling Brazil that the Republic shouldn't have destroyed Canudos. It should have worked harder to assimilate them. Canudos is, as he says, only a failure of the Brazilian state. But he conveniently leaves out any mention of what the people of Canudos thought or did or wanted. For him, they already rightfully belonged to the Brazilian state, and they were merely awaiting to be incorporated. To think about the history of Canudos through the lens of sympathy that Da Cunha gives us in Ossertois is to forget that the people of Canudos were more than these voiceless and silent people who actually wanted nothing to do with the new project of the modern Brazil. And the lasting popularity of Ossertois in Brazil and its prominence at the key turning point of the new republic is no accident. The book showed how the government could really stop rebellions in places like Canudos, not by allowing them their way of life, but by slowly encroaching upon them, by insisting on conversion and integration rather than outright destruction. The new Republic of Brazil wasn't going to be founded on violence, but on conversion. Da Cunha brings Canudos, the renegade community that was desperately trying to avoid incorporation, into the heart of the national playbook, thus giving the Republic a reason and a foundation on which to homogenize and unify the nation. It was this large heterogeneous country that just wasn't one thing. It was many different things. And so how are you going to turn it into one thing? And to some extent, the kind of commemoration of this tragedy is a way to turn it into one thing, if that makes sense, right? So that's, that's the way I started thinking about him as, in some ways, as sentencing Canudos, <laughs> or eliminating all other possible ways of remembering it. It only becomes now the kind of crucible in which the nation is forged. A big question for history is then, what was Canudos actually like? If da Cunha simply assimilated the story of Canudos into the national story of Brazil, then maybe through research we can learn what the project of Canudos actually was. So historians since Osertois have gone back and tried to figure out what actually happened at Canudos. Was the town really a medley of criminals and vagrants like da Cunha described? There are other accounts and oral histories that describe Canudos as peaceful, self-sustaining, even prosperous. Could Canudos instead have been an egalitarian, communistic utopia? And I think part of the complication of something like Canudos is so overdetermined, it's been so overrepresented in so many ways that you can't get at the real kernel of what it is. And this is why I'm not a historian, because historians think that you can. For Johnson, a historical text like Ossertois is not like a dusty window that we can look at to find some real fact of the matter behind it. We can't just squint carefully and discover what really happened. A more productive way to think of historical events is to think of them as black holes. We never directly see them, but we can always notice how they warp the historical record around them. 
And what I was trying to suggest from what I had learned from subaltern studies is um, that documents like this text, those sertones that I was analyzing, it is in itself an artifact, and you have to study it as an object itself with its own logic, rather than thinking of how it gives you access to something else. So it does bear the traces of other things. And this is why it went to the kind of black hole metaphor, because it's something that we can't see, in fact, but we know it's there. And it warps the universe around it through its density and gravity. And I like this idea of like forces that shape and warp things, but you can't see them. You just know that they're there. And so if you start to think of historical documents as um, warped by the pressure of something, and you understand that it, the way it comes out is as a consequence of that warping, then you don't understand it anymore as something that just neutrally represents the historical events, right? We must doubt the historian, the representer, even when they seem empathetic or mournful like de Cunha critical of the nation state, they never give us direct access to history. Canudos is a great example of this because de Cunha's account was taken as a perfect representation of Canudos for all sorts of nation building political reasons. He seems to be on the side of the voiceless, but he really isn't. His approach is exactly in line with the expansionist homogenizing thrust of the military expeditions that he thought he was against in the first place. It's not just a matter of changing our narrator to someone less biased or less entangled with the project of nation building. To do justice to Canudos is to think of their project as one that strove for autonomy, one that didn't want to be a footnote in someone else's story. Canudos doesn't want any interpreters, and it doesn't want anything to do with the modernizing project of those that live in the metropoles. To really embrace that autonomy, we must reject the claims of modern nations and globalizing projects that arrogate to themselves the power to unify and homogenize the world with sympathy and inclusion. Not everyone, after all, wants to be included. And something really essential is lost when we, like Da Cunha did, try to force that inclusion to happen. One way that Johnson defends this spirit is by refusing to call Canudos by the name that the locals called it, Belo Monte. Perhaps Canudos really was Belo Monte, but when we talk about Canudos, what we're really talking about is the web of historical narratives that have built up around this event from the perspective of people like de Cunha and beyond. To the extent that it was kind of, be, became known in the archive under the name Canudos, I still wanted to, I wanted to remind the readers that I was never promising real access to something else. 